Salutations, respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland. I'm on King Street in London. Now, there's more than one King Street in London. I don't know the um, postcode. Uh, this one is beside Covent Garden. But behind me is the house where Thomas Arn lived. Uh, he was born in 1710 in London, not here, a bit uh, further east in the city of London. The city of London is the area around St. Paul's Cathedral, about a mile in every direction from St. Paul's Cathedral. It's the financial district. But uh, he, his family was a middle class one, not especially wealthy. His father died when Thomas uh, was very little. Um, so they were, they were in straightened circumstances for a bourgeois family. But he managed to go to Eton, partly was helped out by some um, uh, affluent relatives. Um, and uh, his, his first love was always music. Um, he's not so much classics or anything like that. So um, when he left school, he did not go on to university. Um, only about half of the boys from Eton would have gone to, on to university in those days. And then it would have only have been Oxford or Cambridge, or else they'd go and join their family firm. Quite rare to have a family firm in those days because trade was considered under. Um, they wouldn't be in the counting house that uh, was unaristocratic. Um, they shouldn't sully their hands with commerce. Often they were from um, Blue Blood and Broad Acres just running their estate, being gentlemen of leisure. And the leisured classes could get into politics. About the only profession they thought was acceptable was, was the law, being a barrister, not a solicitor. I recall some, um, some old Etonian who was there in the, in the 70s said, the trouble about being at Eton is I don't know any solicitors, because it's a divided legal profession here. You're either a solicitor or you're a barrister. Now, nine out of 10 lawyers in this country are, are um, solicitors. But that's not the case anymore. There are plenty of Eltonian solicitors. Um, or else um, become a clergyman, okay, a, a priest in the Church of England. Even though they weren't particularly religious, um, it was a safe career. It could be very handsomely remunerated. Get yourself a living, a parish with a good, with a good salary. So if you were musically inclined, that was an option, but uh, he, he didn't go for holy orders. So he came here to London and made his name um, as a musician and also as a composer. He knew um, Handel, Georg Friedrich Handel was the grand old man of, of, of British music, even though he was German, had been almost middle aged when he came to this country. Um, and he lived not that far away, um, just off Hanover Square. Um, so Arna is best known for um, composing Rule Britannia. He teamed up with a Scots poet called James Thompson. Um, Thompson without a P. The Scottish spelling of Thompson is without a P. The English spelling is with a P. So anyway, um, Thompson had come to London in the 1730s. Um, though he often lived in Richmond upon Thames, which was then considered just outside London, um, and to be in uh, the county of Surrey. Uh, and so it was the time of great Jacobite activity. Remember, in 1688, King James II was overthrown, and he fled abroad. So James II's son was James III to Jacobites. So Jacobus is in James in Latin, whereas the Hanoverians from 1714 that dynasty was ruling King George I, King George II, King George III, and on and on. But um, anyway, so the Hanoverians were here, most of them were Hanoverians. There's a small minority of Jacobites. Obviously, it's very dangerous to be known as a Jacobite. But um, there was a considerable number of Jacobites in Scotland because the Jacobite dynasty was, was more closely associated with Scotland than with England. Um, anyway, so this was an anti-Jacobite song, and the Jacobites had been in France. Later on, they lived in Rome under the protection of the Pope and they were Catholics, and the Pope recognized them as the rightful um, kings of Ireland, um, kings of Great Britain. Of course, the Act of Union had come in in 1707. England and Wales united with Scotland to form the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And uh, that was uh, quite controversial, unpopular in Scotland, and so the Jacobites latched onto that issue. They preferred to call themselves King of Scots and not recognize uh, the title King of Great Britain said so there's not a single kingdom. There are two separate kingdoms on the this island of Great Britain. There's England and then there's Scotland. Wales being a principality attached to England. Anyway, so um, imperialism was very much the order of the day. There was expansion. The Honorable East India Company was acquiring more land in India. There were the British colonies on the coast of America. Um, Canada was still in French hands and uh, the British uh, immigrants in America were moving further west. Obviously, some islands in the Caribbean had been seized by the United Kingdom, and uh, British sailors, or should I call them pirates, were kidnapping people or purchasing victims of kidnapping on the coast of West Africa and taking these people across um, the Atlantic in the most horrendous conditions. And they were then made to toil in the, in the Antilles, um, and it really was um, hellish for them. So the UK was doing the most evil acts imaginable at the time. But anyway, 
So their anti-Jacobite song, they wrote Rule Britannia. Well, James Thompson wrote Rule Britannia and Arne provided um, the uh, melody for it. So the words, it goes, rule, um, when Britain first at heaven's command arose, arose, arose from out the hours your main. This uh, was the charter, the charter of the land and guardian angels sang this strain. Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. Britons never, 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 never shall be slaves. So try and try and give an exegesis of the lyrics. So um, when Britain first arose from out the azure waves, so as in they found it in the formation of the world, according to Genesis, there's any water, then land comes up. Uh, so it come, it's coming out of the azure waves, as in they're blue. Um, the charter of the land, well, the charter is obviously a document granting rights, and the idea says, says that God has given the, given the United Kingdom these rights. And even the use of the word Britain was a fairly new thing. It had been, been used um, in... Um, the Dark Ages, fallen out of use in about the 10th century AD, brought back into usage in the 16th century by Dr. John Dee, one of the advisors of Elizabeth I. Um, uh, okay, so the Charter of the Land and Guardian Angel sang this strain as though angels, and obviously it's a meaning like messenger in ancient Greek, so it's a God's message that, of this. Obviously there's no biblical basis to believe that. It's um, a complete um, fantasy, um, even if you're a very fervent Christian. Um, Britannia rule the waves, not rules the waves. So notice it's imperative, it's not descriptive, that sentence. Um, so um, nations not so blessed as thee must in their turns to tyrants fall, but thou shalt flourish great and free, the dread and envy of them all. So I'll try and give you an interpretation of those lyrics. So um, other countries aren't so lucky, and they will be ruled by tyrants from time to time, but you are going to um, thrive and grow rich. Um, and uh, they will all be jealous of you, and they'll all be scared of you. So that would be the meaning in modern English. Just trying to think if I can remember another verse. Um, uh, more dreadful, still more dreadful from each um, uh, foreign stroke, shalt thou rise. Um, and I can't remember, something is the loud blast that tears the skies. So every time they try to hit you, um, you'll only become more powerful, um, just like the very noisy wind. Um, and something about shall serve to root thy native oak. Yeah, more dreadful from each foreign stroke shall serve to root thy native oak. Oak being obviously a metaphor for a family, like family tree, as in the house of Hanover, suggesting it's a native oak when it's not very native. Of course, um, in 1714, when Queen Anne died um, with no surviving children, um, her closest relative was it been the Jacobite claimant, um, uh, James III, the Jacobites called him, but they passed over him and 58 um, Catholic claimants to the nearest Protestant relative, the 59th closest relative, the Elector of Hanover. So Hanover is a state in northern Germany, was um, independent, and remember there's a Holy Roman Empire, and the, the Holy Roman Emperor was elected, but only elected by, by about a dozen men, and so Elector, or Kurfürst, was a title in German, a hereditary title. Um, so that's why he came over. George I, who was then middle age, only spoke very limited English, didn't want to have to meet with his government ministers all the time because he couldn't keep up with what was being said. I suppose they could have done it in French, which he spoke quite well. Um, so he said, why don't you just meet without me? And that's how the cabinet started going. And that's how um, uh, Sir, Sir Robert Walpole was recognized as the first prime minister. Though the, the title of prime minister had been used on and off for a couple of centuries prior to that. So um, this is Thomas Arno was responsible for that. Um, so it's a hymn of imperialism, really, and it involves this um, ludicrous claim that God um, granted the United Kingdom the right to rule the world at heaven's command. That's a bit of it. You should read that book by Jan Morris about the British Empire entitled At Heaven's Command. So it's part of, I suppose, British Israelism, the notion that uh, the United Kingdom had replaced um, Israel as the chosen people in God's eyes, uh, which, of course, is complete nonsense. There you are. Um, so he died in 1778 um, and uh, James Thompson didn't survive him very long, but he's a bit younger. Well, that is Thomas Arne, a figure who prefers to be better known. That song, uh, Rule Britannia, it's sung at the last night of the proms. The proms concert go on, go on through July and August at Royal Albert Hall. Um, so Henry Wood began in the late 19th century and uh, they have all sorts of uh, classical music and composers and musicians, not uh, well, and whatever, uh, conductors from all sorts of countries and, and the star doesn't have to be British at all but the last night of the proms is usually uh, so usually the um, first Saturday in September and um, the, 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 the star of the show he or she will wear some sort of fancy dress they won't wear evening dress as people usually 
like it's an evening dress for a lady or a dinner jacket for a man. Well dressed, one of them kind of the Olympics wore a tracksuit. One time this woman appeared in breeches as in wearing 18th century men's clothes. I can't remember that woman's name. Um, and so there's, there's obviously a light-hearted aspect to it, but they will, be, they will end with a medley of patriotic British music like Rule Britannia and, um, uh, goodness, I can't remember that one, of Sovereign Brow's Beloved Renown by Diane Emma Set. Um, the one based on recessional, the Elgar did the tune, I can't remember why I can't. A.C. Benson wrote the words, but the title escapes me. Um, Land of Hope and Glory, that's it. And they'll obviously they'll have a Royal Britannia as well. So for the establishing shots of London, they often show this one, especially it's an American film, as in the tune going dun 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 mockingly played by the Dubliners in their tune about uh in their song about Lord Nelson's statue being blown up blown up in in Dublin in 1966. Well that's enough about Thomas Arna, a largely forgotten figure, sadly.